Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And in a few seconds, we will be here with Living Answers for today. I'm waiting for Facebook to catch up with us. And as soon as they get on live, we'll be on live. Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake, Jr. from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And this is Living Answers for today. I'm here tonight to answer questions about the Word of God, to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that he himself is the answer to the complex problems you face today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he cares about you. And this is a Bible question and answer program. A lot of people sent their questions in ahead of time by email, and my daughter forwards them to me. She, uh, she tracks them down and forwards them to me about uh, somewhere between 5 and 6 o'clock. And then I cut them up. I actually have to print them and cut them up. And then also, uh, while we're on live, you can put a live question in the comment section on Facebook. And Pastor Mark is here tonight, and he will write the questions down and bring them over to me. He's on the other side, of, the other part of the room here. I do this from my home, and I have this little professional can't look at my computer screen. But it's never dumb to ask questions. That's how we find I do have a lot of good questions here tonight, and it's exciting what God is doing in this day. Now, we live in a difficult time. We live in a time when people don't know which way to turn or what's going on. Well, what I've been telling the congregation at church for 49 years is cheer up. Things are going to get worse because what we're doing now is a forerunner of world control. The Bible talks about a one world government coming. The Bible talks about one man taking it over. The Bible talks about a worldwide religion causes the world to worship that individual, that this person will have total control. And it's going to go on for a period of seven years when he comes on the scene. And there is going to be a rapture of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be caught up. And it's going to be an amazing time. But it's going to get worse than it is right now. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Because the world's going to be in such condition, they're going to think this man has all the answers economically, politically, socially, every single way. He will have all of the answers. And they're going to say, well, now we're going to have peace because of this man. But the Bible warns when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. We're living right near that time. You can't set dates. Jesus said it's not for you to know the passage of time nor the appointed time. And if Jesus said it's not for you to know, you're not going to figure it out. And there's been people down through history that have thought they've had the date all figured out, ignoring the words of Jesus. He said it's not for you to know. And if Jesus said it's not for you to know, it's not for you to know. He's the final authority. But we're to live as men and women expecting our Lord. And the issue is, do you know Jesus Christ? He is coming for those that have a relationship with him. Okay? The Bible says those that are Christ at his coming will be caught up to meet him. You may be a brand new Christian just the moment before he comes. But if you receive Jesus Christ and you're living on the inside of your life, you will be caught up. The Bible talks about the overcomer. But if you read 1 John chapter 5, who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Christ. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The overcomer is someone that has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I remind you again, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. The Bible says he that has the son has life. He that doesn't have the son does not have life. And the Bible defines belief. Okay, he gives life to those that believe in him. For as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. It defines believing as personally receiving Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him. And by the way, the New Testament says to believe in to Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus explained when he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And uh, he, he says, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that's bearing fruit, he prunes it so it may bring forth more fruit. If a man is not continuing to remain in me, he has cast forth a branch and is withered. And then gather them and cast them in the fire they're burned. Remain in me. So it's that relationship with Jesus Christ that makes us right with God and helps us begin. It's a lifetime process of becoming what God wants us to be. And he's able to take care of us in, in every situation of life, no matter how bad it gets, no matter what the circumstance is, God will see us through. He will, not, he will not abandon us. He will not forsake us. He will not turn his back on us. He says, okay, 
Uh, he says, I will no, not leave you, nor not, not forsake, no, not forsake you. He uses five negatives in one sentence. I'll no, not leave you, nor not, no, forsake you. I just won't do it. I won't leave you when you know me. Now, you can walk away from God, but he will not leave you. So if you walk away from him and you break the relationship, that's up to you because God never takes away our free will. Okay, I'm going to start on these questions. In Luke chapter 18, he tells the story of the rich the young man is called the rich young ruler. Okay, and I want to read the questions. And overall about the heart condition of this young ruler. He didn't believe Jesus was truly God. Wealth was his idol. I think there's much to be learned from this short encounter. And actually the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what good thing shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that's God. In other words, if I'm not God, don't call me good. But he said, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, Jesus quoted or paraphrased the last, the young man said, which? And Jesus quoted or paraphrased the last six commandments. And that has to do with our relationship with other people. Okay, not committing a murder, not committing adultery, honoring your father and your mother, not stealing, not bearing false witness, and so on, that type of thing. And he said, well, all this have I kept from my youth up. Well, I'm sure he hadn't, but that wasn't the issue here. And Jesus, he said, what do I lack yet? And what did he say? He said, if you want to be complete, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. And the young man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In other words, his money was his God, because the first four commandments sum up our relationship with God. And Jesus didn't quote them. That's what he was lacking. He was lacking that relationship with God. <coughs> he might have helped the poor. He might have given to feed the hungry. But did he have a relationship with God? And that's the thing. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto you any graven image. I remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so they sum up there. And he wants us to follow, serve him. And then Jesus started the discussion how difficult it is for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, the Jews had this idea, like some false teaching today, that if you're really a man or woman of God, you're going to have all kinds of stuff. You're going to be rich and everything's going to be great. And the New Testament does not teach that. But, 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 they, but, but they had this idea. That's why I said, who can be saved? In other words, if these wealthy people can't be saved, what is hope is there for the rest of us? Because they believe the blessing of God was only on the wealthy. And Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there's a false teaching on that was that, uh, that was embedded in the 11th century A.D., Okay. In the 11th century A.D., this was invented, uh, and my mind slipped on his name. Uh, uh, it was invented by Theophylact. Okay, Theophylact. Well, the eye of a needle was a gate in the city of Jerusalem, and a camel could get through it by really squeezing through. No, because the apostle said, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, with men, this is impossible. In other words, he wasn't talking about some gate that a camel could squeeze through. He was talking about something impossible. How shall a rich man enter the kingdom of God? Well, he said, all things are possible. When Jesus said it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle, he was talking about a darning needle with a big eye about this big and a literal camel. Okay, again, Theophylact in the 11th century A.D. said it was a gate, and that meant its way into a lot of Christian literature. It was not. And that's, that would take a miracle. You now, I tell people, yeah, God can put the camel through the eye of a needle, but it's going to be hard on the camel. And maybe some of you feel like that camel tonight. Maybe you feel like you're going through that difficult time. Maybe you feel like you're hurting so bad. What am I going to do? Now, I know some wealthy people that use their wealth to build the kingdom of God. And they use it. And, uh, and God really blesses them for it. But but a lot of us, if he gave us that much money, a lot of people would be more concerned about doing other things and serving God with it. And I have some friends in different parts of the world that are very wealthy. Uh, one of my friends in Singapore, uh, he had a very high position and he quit his position. And he uses his money and a bunch of Christian businessmen use their money to go to third world countries. 
and they find a Christian that wants to have their own business and they want to use it for a witnessing tool and they help them learn how to conduct business and they help them get their business started and use it for a witnessing tool to reach people with the gospel. He goes into businesses and they give him $100,000 to show his method of biblical management and it proves so successful. They give him so much money to do it, but he uses his money to go and help other people. And that's, uh, that's the purpose of money, not just to leave it stick in the bank. But this young man, obviously, his money was his God. So if, if you hear some evangelists say, if you want to be perfect, send me all, uh, uh, sell everything you got and send me the money. Don't you believe him? Jesus only ever overtold one man that, all right? He only ever told that to one man. And he said, give, he said, give it to the poor and follow the kingdom of God, not give it to some evangelist. But uh, there's a lot of people misusing some of these scriptures. But, but, but he taught us a lot of things. What are you depending on? What are you counting on day by day? Are you counting on your job? Are you counting on your business? Are you counting on the money that you've inherited? Are you counting on your money in the bank? The only thing you can really depend on, the only thing that's substantial is God. Because everything else can disappear in a moment of time. Look how quick the world has been shut down. Look how quick now governments are taking control of their people. There are a couple governments around the world now. If you go to a super, if you go to a grocery store and buy groceries, the grocers have to account to the government for how much money that person spent. They want to keep track of what that person is spending. And cheer up, it's going to get worse as we approach the time when Jesus Christ comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, it's time to stop playing games and get right with God. Okay, get right with God. Okay, okay. then I have a question here uh, in Matthew 12, 43. What's Jesus talking about the seven impure spirits? Uh, uh, he said, if a man is set free from a demonic spirit, okay, and then his house is swept and clean, he, he said, if, said, he goes out and he finds seven other spirits like himself, and he moves back in. Meaning, if even if Jesus Christ sets you free, if you don't receive him, you've got room for the demons to come back in. There has to be someone there, has to be someone living there. And so so that, that, that's what he's talking about in that passage. It's a very long passage. And, uh, you know, this is toward the end of it. Uh, how can I tell the difference between wait and no? Uh, in other words, how did Paul realize that God was not going to heal him? Well, obviously, the Lord told him that I'm not. He, he did because he said, you know, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. He's talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had a tent stake, actually a weapon, a military weapon, a stake in the flesh, not a, not a rose thorn. It says a thorn in the flesh. That's a weak translation. It means a military weapon, a long metal weapon with a point on it, okay? And... Uh, he said, I had a tent stake in the flesh, and I besought the Lord three times that it might depart. And God said, no. Paul said, why? He said, for my strength is made complete in your weakness. Paul said, therefore, I will glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, many of you know, if you've been watching the program, sometimes I stammer and I can't even talk. I can't even get a word out, but it never happens when I preach. And I've asked God, why don't you do that when I'm teaching? Why don't you do that when I'm doing the television thing here? Or, or, or when I'm doing this, as on television for 24 years, why didn't you do it then? And God said, no, because you have to depend on me when you get up to preach. And I never had done it one time in, okay, in all these years preaching, and I'm 90 years old now, still preaching when I get invitations. And so uh, it's, uh, you know, we have to learn to depend on God. But if I tell people, keep on asking Jesus said, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. If you being evil know how to give, give, give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give those things that are needful? And he says in Luke's gospel, give the Holy Spirit to those that keep on asking him. And he talks about importunity, that persistent, I'm not going to, like Jacob, I'm not going to let you go, Leah, bless me. And I tell people to keep on asking unless God says no. Uh, we had one lady one time to, Oh, her a number of years ago, she had an incurable lung disease. She was prayed for every Sunday and every Wednesday night for two years. All right. And then one Wednesday night, she knew she was healed. She went to the doctor the next day and it was gone. But she prayed, every, she asked prayer every single service for two years. And then God did it. Okay. 
what is pre-tribulation rapture? That's the only rapture there is. Uh, the rapture takes place prior to the great tribulation. And you can see the outline. Uh, you see the outline in 1 Thessalonians 4, and that also matches the outline in the book of Revelation. All right. Now, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but the event is. Uh, the word rapture comes from Latin, rapare, which means to be caught up by a force. The word in the Greek New Testament is harpazo. That means to be caught up by a force. So maybe we ought to call it the harpazo instead of the rapture. But actually, uh, the whole time is called the coming, the parousia of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Thessalonians 4 gives the same identical basic outline as the book of Revelation. And what I've told people for years, Bible prophecy goes here and there and back and forth, over here, over there. And the book of Revelation puts it all in chronological order. Well, 1 Thessalonians does the same thing, except in 1 Thessalonians, it's only this wide. In the book of Revelation, it's greatly expanded. It's that big. And so what Thessalonians does in one chapter, actually two chapters, uh, chapter divisions in the wrong place in your Bible, Okay, and then, then the book of Revelation takes 22 chapters to amplify and actually put the order of events the way they are. And what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and uh, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. Now, again, the Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. That was the idiom of the day. And he's writing to a Gentile church. And the Gentile church, when someone died, they said they've gone to sleep. We might say they've passed away. They've expired. They've gone to be with the Lord. It was the idiom of the day. But the New Testament tells us for the Christian to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Okay. And then Paul is on death row in the book of Philippians. And he basically writes and says, for your sakes, I'd rather stay here. But as for me, I want to take down this tent and depart and be with Christ, which is much rather better. So when a Christian dies, their soul spirit goes to be with the Lord. My wife is with the Lord. Now, Paul's going to say those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So when he comes back for the rapture of the church, I make no apologies for saying this. When he comes back for the rapture of the church, Jesus died for the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. And that body is going to be resurrected into a glorified body and rise to meet her in the air. That's in the south part of Kansas City, the body. Okay. And then, so let me give you 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. But at the times and seasons, that's the passage of time and the appointed time, the same words Jesus used, chronos and kairos, you have no need that I run to you, for you know the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a womb with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, that that they should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light. And three days later, he says, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So he clearly shows the church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air, those that are Christ, and then, and then the seven-year great tribulation begins. Now, if you go to the book of Revelation, Jesus himself gives the outline in chapter 1. He tells John, write the things that you had seen. All he had seen so far was, was the vision of Jesus Christ. Write the things that are. That's present tense. That's the letters to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And when you know church history, you can see the whole church history in these seven letters, okay? And then he says, write the things which will take place after these things. In other words, after the things that are. Okay, chapter 4, 1 starts out after these things. I looked and a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, said, that's the ones that as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And chapter 1 says, come up here. And I'll show you the things that must take place after these things. The word church is never used again in the book of Revelation until the story's ended. And then he gives a warning to the church to be that all these things are absolutely true that have been written. But you cannot find the church after Revelation chapter 3 on earth. 
And the word church in chapters two and three is used over 20 times. But it's the whole history of the church. He tells the church at Thyatira because you, uh, of those that have fallen into the, into the teaching of idolatry, eating at the idol's t- table, those that have fallen into idolatry, I'll, I'll throw into great tribulation, but the rest hold fast till I come. He tells the church at Philadelphia, because you've kept the word of my endurance, I will keep you out of that hour of testing, which will come to test all them that dwell on the face of the earth. He uses the very Greek word we get our word hour from, hora. And so he's saying, you won't be here. I'm going to keep you out of that hour. If God keeps you out of Tuesday, you're not going to be in Tuesday. And, and the church is in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5, singing, you've redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation, made us under all God, kings, and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. And the, the great tribulation period begins in Revelation 6. The rider on the white horse is the false Christ, the imitation Christ, and the seven-year tribulation begins. So it's coming as a thief in the night. But again, you cannot find the church after chapter 3. It's not there. It's not there. Okay. So, okay, let me get another question here. Okay, we've got a couple more just came in. Why should we be married? Is that what the question says? Yeah. Okay, because God says so. Because the Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. And uh, you should be married. You're making a commitment. You know, people can live together, but you, there's no real commitment until you're married. When you're marrying, you're making a commitment. And I think it's very important. And uh, you know, when you make that commitment... Because the law, uh, you know, abstain from all appearance of evil. That's the that's the only statement I can think of. But 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 as a pastor, the thing I've seen is commitment. Well, why are people afraid to make a commitment of marriage? What's holding you back from doing that? What's stopping you from doing that? Okay. What does heap burning coals on his head mean? It usually means judgment. Well, it talks about heaping coals on people's heads. No, for your, uh, if your enemy thirsts and if your It's what? It's the one about if your enemy thirsts, give him a drink. And oh, okay. It's in Romans. It's not in Proverbs. It's in Romans. Yeah. 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 That's in Romans. If your enemy hunger, feed him. If your enemy thirsts, give him the drink. In so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, this is not meaning, oh, boy, I'm going to send that person to hell. I, I, I'm really going to judge that person. That's not the meaning of it there in Rome. Is he talking about, again, idiom? Idiom is something that means something in one language or one country may not mean something in another place. For instance, if you're in a country that, that they don't think about baseball and someone does something for you, you say, boy, you hit a homer. He won't know what he's talking about. Who's homer? Or you scored a... Are you scored a touchdown today? And, okay, we use the idiom of our country. But while when he coals of fire on his head, and I actually saw this happen during the Korean War. I was in a, pat, in a Korean pastor's home, and it was freezing out, freezing out. I know the night we landed there, it was 14 below zero. And it was freezing out, but it was warm in the house, and I didn't see a furnace. I didn't see anything. I said, how are you heating the house? He said, we have coals under, we have hot coals underneath the floor. And that's actually what that idiom is in the book of Romans. If your enemy hungers, feed him. And the custom was that if you ran out of the hot coals to put under the floor of your house to heat it, the lady would p- p- put the pail on her head. She would go to the neighbor and they would heat, and they would take hot coals and put in her Uh, in the pot on her head, and she'd carry it back. So what he's saying, if your enemy hunger feeds him, you're going to warm him. If he thirsts, give him the drink, you're going to warm him. Okay, it's not bringing judgment on people. That's why it's important to know the idiom. And that's the hardest thing to learn is the idiom of the Bible, because we're not there. KK, we're a couple thousand years removed from it. And and I think it's the same thing about being married. Uh, You... The Bible says we're to live righteously before God and men. 
And again, why aren't you making a commitment to that lady? Why aren't you making a commitment to that man? And I think it's very important to be married. And if you have children, especially if you have children, it's important to be married. Okay. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to look at some of these other questions here. Uh, why does God save some people and not others? Well, he's given us a free will. They have to respond. The Bible says many are called. And then the English Bible says you know, few are chosen, but the word chosen means called out. And as you read the Bible, God calls people, but you have to respond. That's like he said in Revelation 3, I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and feast with that person and that person with me. It's making a commitment of your life to God through Jesus Christ. That's when you get saved. Now, if you're talking about, but then it goes on, it seems like they're talking about physical healing. Uh, why did my cousin die even after we prayed for him to be healed? If God provides for our needs, why do some people go hungry? How can God, how can God be three people in one God? Well, he's not three people, he's three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't understand how God could create a billion times a billion worlds, but he did it. I don't understand how God could, could, how God could put my sin on his son 2,000 years ago when I came to him when I was 19, forgive my sin and totally change my life. I don't understand all those things. I don't understand how, how God the Son could become that helpless baby and still be 100% God and 100% man. Because God is so far beyond us. It's incomprehensible. But I know that's the truth of the gospel. The Bible, Bible teaches God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And at a point in time, God the Son became 100% man and 100, and he didn't stop being God. You know, Isaiah said 700 years before his birth, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth the Son, call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. And that's what he does. How can that happen? I don't know. I don't know, but it is. And that's what the Bible teaches. And uh, but, but again, how could God speak and create a billion times a billion worlds? I don't know. But how could God come into my life and change me? But he did. And and, and I've seen him do, do that literally for thousands of people. Uh, now, when you pray for healing, I don't, I don't have an answer. I really don't have an answer. Sometimes God just says, no, it's time for that person to come home. The Bible says it's appointed and the man wants to die. And I believe man has an appointment unless God unless God chooses to change it. And God does hear prayer. I've seen God heal people over the years. My wife had an amazing gift of praying for people. Even the week before God took her home, she prayed for a lady with cervical cancer came into church for the first time, scheduled for surgery that week. And that's the four specialists that told her she had to have surgery. Next day, they couldn't find the cancer. And yet my wife was diabetic, had Alzheimer's, was legally blind. Okay, I don't know why. My wife had her stomach out in 1991. And uh, this is an amazing. We almost lost her three times in six days. And God chose to heal her. And after that, she traveled all over the world with me until she started to come down with Alzheimer's. And then it was too difficult for her to travel to these other countries where I go to teach. But uh, there's no easy answer on healing. I wish there was. You know, I wish God had given us the Bible plus volumes of easy answers, but there wouldn't be enough volumes. (laughs) Uh, what's between? Uh, what's the difference between the judgment seat for believers and unbelievers? Well, unbelievers will not be before the judgment seat of Christ. They will be before the great white throne judgment that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. The ungodly will stand before the great white throne, okay? And the, 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 the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. Paul's writing to Christians when he says, we, and he's talking about being faithful into what God's called you to do and says, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ for rewards. You won't be judged for your sin. Your sin, if you're a Christian, was judged at Calvary. God does not hold your sin against you. It was judged at Calvary. God forgives and God forgets. Don't you wish we had a forget switch like that? 
God forgives and God forbids, but the judgment seat of Christ will be for rewards. What have we done for the kingdom of God? What have we done? Paul says the Thessalonians are his crown of rejoicing, those that he's led to the Lord. And uh, the Bible talks about, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, talks about being judged. But, but again, it's for work. It's for work, what we've done for the kingdom of God. Okay. Why was Peter saved and Judas was not? Because Judas didn't repent. Peter did. Peter went out and wept bitterly. He repented. Okay, and uh, Judas did not repent. He, uh, the Bible indicates that he kept stealing the money out of the bag. It uses the Greek, Greek imperfect tense. So obviously he was the treasurer of the twelve, and he kept taking money out of the bank, uh, out of the bag. People would give donations, and he kept taking money out of it, and uh, he went out and hanged himself. Okay, it was too late. Uh, one of my professors many years ago asked, "What if Judas would have waited four days?" What if he'd have waited four days? I think, you know, God would have forgiven him, but he didn't wait. He didn't wait. Okay. Uh, many Christians are saying it's wrong to speak out against homosexuality because it's judging and we have to tolerate it. Well, well, well we have to be very kind to the people, but the Bible still calls it sin. And the Bible is very clear. Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Timothy, very, very clear about it. But it doesn't give you a right to mistreat people because they're that way. Okay? You can call sin, sin, but do it in love. Hey, God cares about you. God loves you. I have prayed, okay? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I have prayed with people I knew were homosexual, praying that God will meet their needs. And that, that God will somehow minister to them. And God, and, uh, you know, you have to treat people with love. You can call sin, sin, but you're not going to reach anybody with a yeah, yeah, yeah attitude. You, you know, you can't do that. But the Bible clearly says homosexuality is a sin. It's listed with adultery, fornication, and the other sins of the flesh. And, and the Bible's very clear on it. And the Old Testament, you know, calls it a sin. And the New Testament calls it a sin. And, uh, you know, we need to pray for people and let people know God loves them and God cares about them. We all have to be set free from something. But it's never an excuse to mistreat people. Never, never, never an excuse to mistreat people. Okay. Okay, I've already answered those two. Uh, explain the entire verse of 1 Corinthians seven fourteen. What does it mean that the unbeliever is sanctified by the marriage? Well, it indicates if you're married to an unbeliever, it says don't leave him for the unbeliever is sanctified by the marriage. Else we are children unclean, but now they're holy. But as you read the rest of the, the rest of the New Testament, it makes it clear that the influence of the godly parent, okay, on the children, uh, is still there. Uh, even if you're married to an unbeliever, you can be such an influence on your children. And all the way through the New Testament, it talks about into it, it talks about influence. Train a child up in the way he should go when he's old, he'll not depart. So even if you're married to a non-Christian, you can have that kind of an influence on your children. Now, little children, of course, are part of the kingdom, but as they grow, they have to make a decision. Children can receive the Lord very early. I can't remember if my son George was four or five years old or what he was. He had an older sister, two years older than him. He was laying in bed crying one night. And my wife went in and she said, Georgie, what's the matter? He said, Linda saved, I not saved. And she led him in the sinner's prayer that night. And of course, he's pastoring the church now. He's 60 years old now. And he's pastoring Sheffield Family Life Center here in Kansas City. He's the, he's the lead pastor. He's on the board of Evangel College. He's a general presbyter. He's assistant superintendent of the Southern Missouri District of the Assemblies of God. And, and, uh, and then his son, his youngest son, is actually one of the youth directors for the Assemblies of God. And so, so you, you influence your children. 
I don't know what the ex-evangelical movement is. Never heard uh, what are your thoughts on the ex-evangelical movement? I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, can you explain Matthew 7, 23? This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Some people came and said, Lord, we've done miracles in your love. We've done many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. What do you mean? Just because you're doing works in Jesus' name, you have to have a relationship with him. I was a church member until I was 19. I was baptized. I was actually an usher in the church. But I never knew I could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I met him when I was 19, and that, that, that totally revolutionized my life. And so that's the thing there. I, I never knew you. Uh, I could have done things. I thought I'm doing these for the Lord. No, no, no. I've got to know him. I've got to have a relationship with him. Again, he that has the son has life, and he that doesn't have the son does not have life. Okay. So he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. Uh, here's a pretty technical question. I'm having a discussion with someone uh, who says the word eugenes in Acts 17, 11, translated as noble-minded. It's actually when Paul left Thessalonica, okay, it says the people, the Bereans, were more noble-minded, okay? Uh, the New American Standards talks it as noble-minded, and uh, the, the NASB is correct. He said it's really saying the Bereans were well-born or higher in rank than the Jews. Uh, uh, the Jews of Thessalonica, he also said that he studies exhaustively regarding the cultural context of the people in this passage of scripture, and that the Eugenes is referring to the status, rank, and society of the Bereans as opposed to their noble-mindedness. No, that's not true. Uh, the, word, uh, the word that's actually there in 1 Thessalonians is made up of, you know, Eugenes, but then it's also, it's a compound verb, and it has the word heteros connected to it. See, in this particular case, uh, uh, it's actually you, I, I'm stammering, Eugenestera, and it has, it has heteros, which means another of a different kind, okay? And actually, if you check up the word uh, in Koine or Common Greek, it was used for being more open-minded. It was used for being superior in the context. In other words, if you're talking about someone being a better mechanic, you could use this word. But it was primary use for people that that were more open-minded, in addition to people being different by noble birth. But the fact that it has heteros connected with it, it's a compound word made up of those two words. Okay. So it actually does mean open-minded in that context. So it was used both ways. It was used both ways. The word by itself, yes, would mean noble. However, when it's got heteros connected with it, it can be open-minded. Open-minded. Okay. What does it mean when it says, do not wish them God's speed? Isn't that in James where he says that, don't wish them God's speed? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I uh, you know, I don't think it's wrong to say God be with you. I think it's unbelievers. Yeah, to say it to unbelievers. And there's a lot of phrases, a lot of catchphrases I don't like anyway. And because they're so contrary to scripture. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Schofield Bible? The Schofield Bible is extreme, radical dispensationalism. Radical dispensationalism. And uh, it, uh, it propagates a lot of things. It propagates uh, Genesis 1 being, being translated, the earth became shapeless and uninhabitable, which is a totally indefensible translation. And, but it's a radical, radical dispensation. Uh, a lot of things were propagated by the Schofield Bible that have been proven untrue by scholars. And I had a Schofield Bible when I first got saved, and everybody was using it and reading all the footnotes and stuff. And uh, it didn't take me long to decide I didn't want that Bible. Okay, I didn't want that Bible. Uh, trying some more here. 
Uh, <coughs> what does it mean to have a form of godliness be nigh the power thereof? Well, I had a form of godliness before I got saved. I went to church. I never read the Bible, but I went to church, and I was an usher in the church, and I went through all the ritual, but I didn't know Jesus Christ. And when you meet Jesus Christ, you find out there's power in the name of Jesus. You see people's lives change. You see people healed. You see miracles take place. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul says, Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. For there is the righteousness of God revealed out of faith into faith. And meaning a step at a time in your life. But, but you can have a form of godliness. You can claim to be Christian. I go to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. I remember someone saying when I was first saved, just because you go to an automobile garage, that doesn't make you a car. It's the same way, just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian, okay? Just, just like if you're living in America, it doesn't make you necessarily an American. <coughs> Explain the many different fillings of the Holy Spirit. Well, there, you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, okay? That's not called a filling. Okay, and it's and because Jesus breathed on the apostles in John chapter 20 and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. Of course, when Jesus said something, it happened. He told the same ones, now you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to be immersed in the Spirit for power. And when it happened, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But I know, however, then other times when we're speaking of the Sanhedrin, it will say Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. So even though you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, there comes sometimes a rush of the Holy Spirit and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and it gives you compulsion to say something or compulsion to do something. And that happens many times in the book of Acts. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they answered the Sanhedrin. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with joy. It's subsequent fillings, but, you, but the initial filling is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so when they were baptized in the Spirit, they spoke languages they didn't know. But, but, but then you're refilled. You almost call it refilling, but I call it like a rush of the Spirit. He, he just comes upon you and does that. And, I, and, and you have that happen so many times in your life. I know the last time I preached at Sheffield, I was deciding what to preach. And I sat down at the table here and this power of God came on me. And I started preaching a sermon. And I asked God, who am I preaching to? He said, yourself. And he gave me a sermon for myself, but he said, that's what you're going to preach the next Sunday. And that, that's, that, 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 that's that rush of the Holy Spirit. And he does that when you're witnessing to people. He does that when, when, when you're praying for people. He gives you that refilling, as I call it, but it's a rush of the Holy Spirit. And that's what you read about in the book of Acts. Okay. That's what you read about in the book of Acts. I've heard that the covenant ceremony in Genesis 15 served as a ratification of God's covenant with Abram, which existed in whole as a Sovereignian battle treaty, like the one God used at Sinai. My understanding is these are two completely different covenant ceremonies. In Genesis 15, we have an example of one common covenant ceremony, royal and grand, and in Exodus, a different, a different common treaty model. And it's actually a, a, a Suzerian or Sumerian vassal territory. What's your understanding of these passages? Well, I don't get that technical on the uh, on the type of treaty. However, the one in Genesis 15, God told him to take the animals and make two strips, one for God, one for him. And then the fire of the Holy Spirit passed in between them, and it was a covenant between the two of them. The one made at Mount Sinai, God said, if you'll be my people and keep these commandments, you'll be my peculiar people, you'll be my chosen treasure. And the people answered and said, all the Lord said we will do. But they didn't do it. They broke it right away. But the one with Abraham was made that day, and he said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And your in your name, all families of the earth are going to be blessed and so on. And he changed his name ultimately from Abram to Abraham. And he changed Sarai to Sarah, took the are the predominant letter of God's name, which is YHWH, and added to Abram and made it Abraham. And the same was Sarah, a man and woman marked by the name of God. But 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 the technical name or the type of covenant, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. 
In Romans 7, Paul says we'll continue to do wrong things. Why did God make us that way? Doesn't he get disgusted with it? That's not what Paul says in Romans 7. Romans 7 is one of the most misused passages in the entire word of God. That's where Paul says the things I want to do, I can't do. The things I know I shouldn't do, I do. Oh, wretched man, who should deliver me from the body of this death? So with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. But you can't separate Romans 7 from chapter 6 and chapter 8, okay? In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, know that you're dead to sin. He says, reckon you're dead to sin. That means log it down. You're dead to sin. Yield to the Holy Spirit. You used to be the slaves of sin, past tense. Now you're the slave of righteousness, okay? And, and he says all this in chapter 6. Then in chapter 7, he is talking about his life when he was living under the law, trying to be saved by keeping law. Because he starts out, we know, brothers, I speak to them that know the law, how the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. You know, some people like to quote that one verse, but you keep reading it. Okay. And he goes on to explain now, for the woman that her husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, if the husband be dead, the dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. If the, while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. If her husband be dead, she is free from that law. And then she's no adulteress, even though she be married to another man. Wherefore, here's the conclusion of that. Therefore, my brothers, we are dead to the, we have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And then he makes a statement here about this chapter seven. When we were in the flesh, and he goes on to describe how the law brought condemnation to us and how we, how we didn't keep it. Notice he said, when we were in the flesh, you go over to Romans chapter eight, all right? He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. He starts that chapter by saying what the law couldn't do, and that was we through the flesh. That's a man in chapter seven. The law said, don't do this, but gave me no power to stop. The law said, do this, but gave me no power to do it. What the law couldn't do, and that was we through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of flesh of sin, and in behalf of sin, judged against sin in the flesh, that the righteousness, the moral principles of the law, might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But then he tells us, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of Christ lives in you. Well, if you're saved, if you know Jesus, the Holy Spirit's living within you. The man in chapter 7 is trying to be saved by keeping law. And it says, I I've been sold under sin. That means he's a slave to sin. He's already said in chapter 6, the Christian's not the slave to sin. But again, the key passage, when we were in the flesh, that's how the law affected us. But now we're married to Christ. And we're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of Christ be in you. That's what he says. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. My boss asked me today, hey, how can it be easy to be saved? It is. It is. I, you know, uh, you know, Paul mentions to the Corinthians, I'm afraid lest someone deter you from the simplicity that's in Christ. We didn't try to overcomplicate the gospel. <coughs> Excuse, me. Excuse me. And Christians have a tendency to, scholars have a tendency to do that, to overcomplicate it, debate about this, debate about that, wonder about this, wonder about that. Uh, I had a sign on my pulpit for years. It, uh, it, it actually said K-I-S-S. And guest speakers would ask me, what is that sign for? I said, well, it's for my benefit. It means keep it simple, stupid. Okay? We don't have to get overcomplicated. Scholars can debate over things that are really insignificant. Really insignificant. Really doesn't matter a whole lot. Okay? And the gospel is simply, you receive Jesus Christ. You're born again by the Holy Spirit. And then you grow by reading scripture, by attending church, by, by being with other Christians. Okay, pick out people who are going to help you grow in Christ. Uh, where do John Hess and John Wycliffe fit in the Reformation? 
that they were very significant, especially Wycliffe with his translation and uh, as translation of the scripture into English uh, and John Hess with his strong, strong gospel preaching, uh, that they were very significant in the Protestant Reformation. And uh, the, uh, you know, God prepared people to do different things. God prepared people to do different things than he did. Uh, but, 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 but again, I love this question about the simplicity of the gospel. Because it is. It's simple. Jesus paid your sin bill. What does that mean? God created us to know him, to have a relationship with him. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. In other words, God just butt out, leave me alone. I want to run my own life. God calls that sin. And so God the Son was born. Because he's holy, he has to judge our sin. George Westlake, you're guilty. You sin. I can't just overlook it because I'm holy. So what did God do? He brought salvation by himself. God the Son, born, lived for 33 years without sin. And then God put the whole sin of the whole human race all the way from Adam to the last person who will ever live on his son. Punish him in our place. That's why you can receive Jesus Christ and God will forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed because your sin's been paid for. And God will never bring it up to you again. And then he takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and puts it down on your, your account. Now, what if some millionaire put his bank account on your under your name and your bank under your account? Well, the righteousness of Christ is put down on your account. And God declares you righteous. Now, it's a lifetime process of learning to live that way. Okay, it's a lifetime process. We never fully make it. The Bible says we'll be like him when we see him as he is. But everyone that has this hope in him keeps purifying themselves even as he is pure. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it talks about heavenly languages. Am I in belief that was said or is it that, 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 that am I in belief that what is said here is just that, a heavenly language? I have someone telling me I'm wrong and be believing that, of course, what the ancient Greek says, but they can't tell exactly what it says, even though they speak fluent modern Greek. I know you have studied ancient Greek and need to understand this better and also a way to correct love provided they are in error. Corrected love. If I am in error, I, I, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, it actually says always oh, speak with the tongues of men and angels is what the Greek text says, angels. And that implies that sometimes when you're speaking in tongues, it may be a language that the angels know. It's implied. I, 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 I've heard English spoken in other countries from people that didn't know English. I mentioned before that when I was in the Korean War in Korea, a little Korean girl about the only English she knew was, G.I., give me some gum. G.I., give me some candy. She was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and she spoke in perfect English like you could write a doctoral dissertation and as clearly and distinctly as I am speaking right now. And she used words like omniscient and talked about God knowing all things and omnipotent and God having all power went on and on and on in English. Okay. And I've heard of other cases like that too. But, 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 but usually it's a language that no one knows. And there's a message in tongues that, and in the, in the church service is to be followed by interpretation. And, and Lord has used me ever since I first got saved in interpretation. And he only gives me one sentence at a time. That's all. He gives me one sentence. And then I say that sentence and he gives me the next one. Because if he gave you the whole thing ahead of time, he'd forget it anyway. Uh, if two people make vows to each other and have children and have been together many years, does God recognize that a valid marriage? Uh, yes, God can. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. The ideal was if possible. And I say if possible. I have preached in a country uh, and uh, uh, in that country, if there's a divorce, you have to go through you know, a particular religious organization uh, had to get the divorce annulled. And it cost a lot of money to do that. And what do you do with someone that doesn't have a lot of money to do that and her husband has run off? 
And I actually told the pastors when I was teaching over there, I said, I would do a religious ceremony for them. I would do a religious ceremony for them in the sight of God. And they said, that's exactly what they do. I have done that in this country. I have done religious ceremonies for people that have been together and had children. And for some reason, it was not possible for them to have a legal marriage. Okay. And, uh, and I told them now this will not hold up. I know as far as legal things are concerned, but in God's sight, yes. And I have done that for a couple of people. As a matter of fact, a few times, because I've been in the same church, the church now 49 years, and we've seen all, all kinds of situations, all kinds of circumstances. I remember I had a couple come to me many years ago and said, Pastor, uh, we want to get married. Will you marry us? And I said, well, we have a pre-marriage course that you ought to go through. I said, well, we've been together over 30 years, and we have five children. And I said, I'll marry you tomorrow. <laughs> and and I did. Now, they were able to get a license, but I've, I've married couples that were unable to get a license for one reason or another. And the, and uh, they, they had been together for a long time. And I told them it's a religious ceremony in God's sight. It doesn't have any political validity, any legal validity. Okay. And uh, but but what is it that stops you from doing it? What is it to stop? If you can't, that's one thing. That, that's one thing. And uh, is Noah an example of the rapture? Well, it could be. It, it, yeah, yeah, it could be an example. Uh, you know, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, they're going to be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So shall the parousia coming of the Lord be. Two shall be in the field, one taken up, the other left, two grinding at the mill. Actually, the word, word, means, word means to be taken alongside the other left. And that's he's talking about the rapture in those particular. He said as it was in the days of Lot. It wasn't until Lot when, so it's going to be, it wasn't until Lot went out of Sodom that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what it's going to be. They were eating, drinking, marrying in the same way until the day that, you know, the angel of the Lord took Lot out. And the angel of the Lord actually told Lot, I can't destroy the city till you're gone out. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot. The New Testament to me is overwhelming. Now, why do some, some Christians believe in a mid-tribulation rapture? Because under the opening of the sixth seal, oh, okay, under the first seal of the seventh seal book, under the first seal, the Antichrist makes his appearance. Under the second seal, there is war. Under the third seal, there is worldwide famine. Under the fourth seal, 25% of the earth's population is killed. Under the fifth seal, there are martyrs because people will be saved all during the great tribulation. And then under the sixth seal, it says the heavens, de and this takes us up to the middle of the tribulation, the heavens depart as a scroll when it's rolled together and people see straight through to the throne of God. Just imagine you're looking up and all of a sudden the heavens disappear. They see straight through to the throne of God and it says they cry to the rocks and mountains and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who's able to bear it. So they say, well, that's when the rapture takes place. But you don't read of any rapture right there. Now, let me ask, a, ask another couple of questions. Jesus said when the rapture takes place, it's going to be business as usual. You think 25 percent of the earth's population being killed under the four seals business as usual? Do you think worldwide famine is business as usual? No, no. The rapture takes place before all that happens. And then something else. Once the heavens depart and they see the throne of God and realize this is the great day of the Lord, the day of his wrath, do you think they're ever going to be convinced that two witnesses are causing it? Well, you read when you get to the 11th chapter inside the seven seal book that for three and a half years, Two witnesses are witnessing, and they're thinking they're bringing all these plagues, and, and the Antichrist kills them, and then they come back to life. But it says when he kills them, they give gifts one to another because the two witnesses that were tormenting them for three and a half years are finally dead, okay? Why? Because they take place in the first three and a half years. Do you think after the heavens depart as a scroll, they'd ever think to... They never believed two witnesses were causing this. 
No, the two witnesses witness for the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. So the whole thing is seven years, according to Daniel's prophecy, called the Daniel 70th 7, okay? 77s. Is there a difference between paradise and heaven? Not for the Christian. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, when people died, they went to a place called uh, Sheol, okay, in Hebrew. Uh, you know, Jacob thought Joseph had been eaten by a wild animal. He said, I will go to him to Sheol, but he cannot come to me. The word Sheol was where the dead went when they died. In the New Testament, it's Hades, okay, because that's Greek. But it's the same place. Jesus illustrated that in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, okay? And Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you read Acts chapter 2 when Peter was preaching. And by the way, Peter's sermon was not a prepared sermon. They didn't know what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost. And when the people were speaking in other tongues, the word speaking uh, in Greek is usually laleo to speak, but there it's, uh, how it says they spoke other languages, it's apoph thengamai, you have P-H and T-H right in a row, apoph thengamai, which is used as prophetical utterance, meaning the Holy Spirit's giving to you at that time. And then when it says Peter stood up and spoke instead of laleo, it's apoph thengamai, meaning it was a prophetical utterance, okay, he did not prepare it, he did not know what was going to take place. And the Holy Spirit was pouring it through him, just like I get an interpretation a sentence at a time. And, and, and he actually quotes the 16th Psalm in that, where he, where he said, David said, you will not leave my soul in Hades, in the Old Testament, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. And he, used, he, he said, it's obvious David wasn't referring to himself because we have his grave here. But it's a resurrection. He's talking about the resurrection of Christ. You will not leave my soul in Hades, okay? You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. And the Jews believe that corruption took place on the on, on about the fourth day. And Jesus was resurrected after three days. And so it, uh, it actually indicates that Jesus was in Sheol. But, but, but again, it's divided into two parts. There was paradise in one side and torment in the other side. And when Jesus... And that's what Jesus told the thief on the cross. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And it indicates it was in the heart of the earth that Jesus had been in Hades, all right? In New Testament, Sheol in the Old Testament. But when Peter quotes it in Greek, okay, he uses Hades. And uh, so you'll not leave my soul in Hades. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. So they were in paradise. Now, when Jesus resurrected, he emptied the paradise side. Okay, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, I knew a man that was caught up to paradise. Paradise had been moved. The paradise side of Hades is now for the Christian now to be absent from the body so to be present with the Lord. When Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He meant the gates of Hades will never close around someone, to, someone who was in his church. Who was in his church? Those that have received him as savior not those who have signed up to be a member of Sheffield Family Life Center. I tell people when I give an invitation to receive Jesus, Sheffield Family Life Center is not the way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. So paradise has been moved. Now, when is the ungodly side resurrected? At the great white throne judgment. The ungodly side is resurrected. Those that didn't know Jesus Christ, those that weren't right with God are going to be resurrected. Again, that's in the book of the end of the book of Revelation. But, but Noah would be an example of the rapture. He escaped it all, too. He escaped it all. You know, translators aren't always very good students of prophecy. In Matthew 24, where it says, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And I've heard people try to set dates basing on that. Well, how long's a generation? That's when the rapture is going to take place. We saw Israel become a nation again within a generation. Well, the primary meaning of the word is descendants of a common ancestor. The generation is a secondary meaning of the word. All Jesus, the primary meaning of the word, descendants of a race. Jesus is just saying the Jewish race will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. 
And then when it says two are in the bed, one taking the other left, uh, two grinding at the mill, one taking the other left. Okay. The, the, uh, I actually got a question a number of years ago. I was teaching in Singapore, and one of the Greek students that believed the church was going through the tribulation, I was actually teaching on Revelation and Daniel, and he said, hey, the Greek Testament says well, the flood came and took them all away in one verse, and the next verse says two in the bed, one taken, the other left. How can you say taken away in the flood means to be taken to destruction, and yet taken in the next verse means to be taken up to heaven? Well, I, I told him if you check your Greek New Testament, you'll find it's two different words. When he says the flood came and took them all away in Matthew 24, okay, took them all away, it's the Greek verb iro. Okay. Okay, that's the one where Jesus says in John 15, every branch of me that's not bearing fruit, my father takes away, the Greek verb I roll. But then when he says two in the field, one taken, the other left, he uses a Greek word paralambano. That means to be received alongside of. That's what Jesus used in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and paralambano you to myself that where I am there ye may be also. In that particular verse, he's talking about the rapture. But, 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 but the promises to Israel are going to be fulfilled. That's one of the purposes of the thousand-year reign of peace, to fulfill the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament that haven't been fulfilled yet. And God keeps his promises. Okay, he keeps his promises. So actually, paradise was a paradise side of Hades, but now heaven is paradise. Okay, it's been moved. It's been moved. Uh, the Bible says that we can ask anything in prayer and we'll receive it, but experience tells me something quite different. This is confusing because even in Matthew, when Jesus goes to pray and his disciples, he prays all night that this cup might pass. Yeah, but then he says, nevertheless, not my will. He knew he was born for that purpose. He was just thinking, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way. Now, there's a couple other things. The Bible says if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And then another statement, Jesus said, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. What you're asking might not glorify God in a way that you might think it will. So sometimes God says no. And sometimes God lets things go get worse so he can perform a bigger miracle. Lazarus died. Lazarus died. And Jesus knew he was already dead, okay? But, but they already knew he was the healer. Now they're going to find out he's the resurrection and the life. That's why he let it go that far. Uh, yeah, I'm starting to catch up with them now. Will you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I've been reading here, some of them. Uh, what is the meaning of haughty eyes? Also, what's the difference between a lying tongue and a false witness who utters lies? Nothing. It's the same thing. Thank you for your faithfulness in bringing us these answers. Haughty eyes, just some so proud of themselves. And just, you know, they kind of wave their eyes around. Looking like, down your nose at people. Yeah, yeah, look down your nose at people. Yeah. You can't look down on people, folks. You might disagree with them, but you can disagree without being disagreeable. Okay. I answered that one already. Uh, which Ten Commandments are the Ten Commandments? The ones listed in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 or the one in Exodus 34? Exodus 34 doesn't give Ten Commandments. It just gives a whole list of other things. Now, God rewrote the Ten Commandments, but, but they're not listed for us in 34. He's giving Moses a whole bunch of other information there. Okay. Other ex Okay, let's see. Well, what are your arguments against Calvinists who believe that in the absolute sovereignty of God? And what does the Bible say about eternal security? I call it unconditional eternal security. Uh, number one, God is sovereign over his own sovereignty. Uh, you see, Augustine wrote a book, wrote a whole volume book, The City of God, and then John Calvin, uh, he codified it into five points. Number one is the sovereignty of God. God, everything moves according to God's will. Well, if you end up in hell, God had to predestine you. So we are predestined. 
And then we are born dirty, rotten, filthy sinners, so we couldn't make up our mind to serve God if we wanted to. He calls us by irresistible grace. When he calls us, we have to come because he's predestined us. And then, therefore, we were unconditional. We were eternally secure. But the Bible says twice in the New Testament that God is not willing that one soul should perish. That's not his will, and yet people are going to perish. God is sovereign over his own sovereignty, and he has chosen to give man a free will. Now, he has foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is not predestination. Foreknowledge knows what you're going to do. If you, you make the choice, he knew you were going to do it, but he didn't make you make that choice. You made that choice on your own. But I believe everyone sometime in their life gets called. Everyone receives the one talent. You get called. So I said many are called and few are chosen. And again, the word chosen means to be called out. You have to respond to the call. And uh, so he, he, a lot of things happen contrary to the will of God. All right? Even though he knew they were going to happen. I don't think God willed for Satan to lead to read his rebellion. And uh, the Bible makes it clear he's not willing that one soul should perish. How many times does God have to say it? It's twice in the New Testament. And again, the last message of the Bible, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hears say, come, let him that's thirsty come, and whosoever wants to, come and drink of the water of life freely. Okay, come and drink of the water of life freely. And whosoever wants to, why you won't want to unless he predestines you. That, 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 that's arguing in circles. That's right. Well, blah, 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 blah. Uh, well, I believe this, so it has to be that 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 that, that, that he makes you come. No, he. If any man here and open the door, well, you can only open the door if he makes you open the door. No, no, no. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you open it. Why did Adam and Eve sin? They had a free will. They had a free will. So we sin because we have a free will. And uh, we, have, we have eternal life because we've received Jesus Christ. Received him. And God knows that if, we, if he calls us, some people will respond. And I think God can preserve your life and cause things to happen. If he sees in the future, you're going to open your heart to Jesus Christ. I believe God lets things happen uh, in your life to preserve you. In Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, supposed to depict the kingdom, uh, as verse 17 suggests, otherwise, when God states he will create new heaven and new earth, passage also goes on to talk about infants. Uh, it talks about bearing children and death. How can this take place in the kingdom if we have glorified bodies? No, that's the nature of Old Testament prophecy. It'll jump between the future and the present. It'll jump between eternity and the millennium. It jumps back and forth. That's why we need the book of Revelation to put things in order for us. It's chapter 66 of the book. That's what I called my book, chapter 66. It puts everything in order, okay? Everything in proper order. And uh, there's a few of these left at the church. Uh, they do have them in the front desk at the church, but, but there's a few left. And, and I can't have them on eBay anymore because now it costs a fortune to get them reprinted. So uh, is it true that a person should not serve in a church to be behind a pulpit without the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No. I know a lot of pastors that have served for years without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I remember one pastor told me he was taught that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not for today. Speaking in tongues isn't for today. And God baptized him one night. He was, I was in the bathtub and started praising God. God baptized him in the Holy Spirit. And he told me, he said, George, I've got so much more power in my life. It's, it's just, it just really made a difference in me. And I've heard that from other pastors, too who were taught that it's not for today. I meet missionaries. I met missionaries in both Africa and Asia who have told me, quote, my denomination doesn't believe this is for today, but I pray in a language I don't know every day because I need all the power I can get. And they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, even though their denomination says it's not for today. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about the book of Enoch? Okay, the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is a third century forgery. Okay, it wasn't heard till about the third century BC. And Enoch, of course, lived before the flood. And uh, 
I know the fact that the book of Jude seems to quote from it, that doesn't mean he puts the he puts approval on the whole book. The apostle Paul quotes from heathen poets. That doesn't mean he approves everything they say. But it is it is not from Enoch, okay? And uh, you cannot, it is not part of the scripture and should not be part of the scripture as also the book of Jasher. Uh, the book of Jasher comes from the 12th or 13th century AD. And it's referred to in the Old Testament, it just means the, the book of the righteous man. And it, it can refer to Samuel or something else. But, but, but what goes under the name of Jasher is not that book of Jasher from the Old Testament. Okay. Does the Bible ever contradict itself? It can seem to, but sometimes it adds. Uh, for instance, you read one story, it says there were two blind men. You read another gospel, it says there was one. But when you read it, one did all the talking. Okay, so this one's only consumed about the one that does all the talking. And you take these stories and you put them together. For instance, if we saw a car go by, and there were about six of us there, we'll say four, four gospels, and one said, look at that car. It's got red wheels. Another one said, hey, did you see two people in that car? Did you notice there's a baby in that car? And one person describing it said, I saw a car with red wheels. Another one said, I saw a car with a baby in it. I saw a car with two adults in it. Okay, you put them together. And that's the same way in the stories of the Bible. Now, the New Testament tells us we're no longer under the Old Testament law. All right? No longer under the Old Testament law. And uh, in Colossians, Paul literally said, Jesus took the law out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Let no man judge you or meat or drink. You're not under the dietary restrictions or in respect of a holy day or the new moon, that's the feast days, or the Sabbath day, okay, which are only a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. Now that Christ has come, we're no longer under that. And the whole New Testament teaches that. It's not a contradiction. It was leading up to that time. When Jesus said, said I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill them. But when he fulfilled it, it was done away with. Done away. Now we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Like Paul says in Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because all the law did was bring condemnation. You can't keep it. You can't keep it. It's impossible. If you ever broke one part of the law, you're a lawbreaker. So, you, you know, we're all lawbreakers. You can't keep it. And but, but, but now we're saved by grace, pure grace. Uh, what causes God to intervene in earthly affairs? We know evil is all around us, but does God just say enough? In our day, not talking about the rapture and time events, uh, not talking about the rapture. Well, 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 well you know, God's timetable, uh, he's told us what this day is going to be like, but, but God intervenes. Uh, he intervenes through prayer. God has limited himself to move as people pray. I'm reminded you when God told Elijah, I'm going to send rain on the earth. Elijah had to pray seven times before it happened. And that's why he said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll pour them out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. But he, it has to be prayer. And Jesus, James says, you have not because you ask not. And we have to be people of prayer. Okay? You need to be like Jacob. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And Jesus told us again, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And if God doesn't intervene, he's going to do something that will bring glory to his name, okay? Or, or he will take it and work it together for your good. doesn't say it's all good, but he says it can work together for good. You know, before I went on the air tonight, I was thinking about the 91st Psalm. He that lives in the secret place of the Most High shall pass the night under the shadow of the Almighty. Earth, life has its nights, all right? And you have to be close to someone to be under their shadow. And so you pass through the secret, you live in that secret place of the Most High, the place of prayer, practicing the presence of God, recognizing there, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on believing God. And, and not only believing, expecting him to answer. And if he doesn't say no, keep on asking. Keep on asking because as we spend time in his presence, we become more like him. Paul says, we beholding the face of the Lord as in a mirror, be being changed in the same image 
out of glory in the glory. Paul liked that phrase, out of glory in the glory, a step at a time. The more time we spend with him, the more we become like him. And so we can manifest the fruit of the Spirit to the people we come in contact peace with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And then I have several questions here on abortion, okay? And when does life start? And, you know, I happened to have lunch with another pastor the other day, and I have a lot of questions on abortion here. And he did a study from the Word of God. The Bible shows life in the womb, okay? In Psalm 139, uh in Isaiah 44, 24, and Jeremiah 1, 5, it shows life in the womb. And killing life is a sin. Murdering life is a sin. And let me just read the, read a couple of these passages that he, he had down here. Uh, actually, uh, okay, here's Jeremiah 1, 5. God is speaking to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord, okay, Okay, before I formed you in the in the belly, I knew you, and before e even you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet unto the people. How can he be sanctified if he's not a person? Okay, and uh, and that's just one case. And this other one, the psalm that uh, the uh, the one my brother mentioned, one hundred thirty nine. Uh, verses 14 to 17, Psalm 139, verses 14. I, I, I'm having trouble with my eyes. Uh, 14 to 17. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, uh, for you have possessed my range. You have covered me even in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous. M -m -m Marvelous are the works. And that my soul know, knows right well. My substance was and hid from them when I was made in, boy, I can't, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Your eyes did see my substance, not yet being imperfect. And in, in the book, all of my members were written, which is on, which were, which were fashioned, when yet there were none of them. Okay, and he goes on to talk about that. And there's other passages of scripture. And, it was a very difficult situation, but life is life. And there are people that, that are willing to adopt children. As a matter of fact, people standing in line to adopt children. And it's, it can be a very difficult, complex, difficult thing to, uh, difficult thing to discuss. And, uh, and I know about some of these places that, uh, you know, anti-abortion places that actually take care of the ladies and the, and they help them financially in every other ways, and uh, it'd be very difficult. Uh, but but the, to me, the Bible's clear. To me, the Bible's clear. But there's debate on that. And and again, we're here to help people. Okay, we're here to bless people. I, I, I've seen situations over the years where one lady was told her baby was dead, and they wanted to take it out. She said, "I'm believing God." We prayed. The baby was born perfect. Baby was born perfect. And uh, so it's, uh, it's sometimes a very difficult decision. But, but, but life, you know, the Bible talks about taking a life. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. How soon is there blood throwing through, th flowing through that? And that's the question our brother pointed out here in his paper. How soon is there blood? The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood in the book of Leviticus. And how soon that happens. Okay, I already answered that question. Uh, let me let me just mention this. Uh, you need to be faithful to your church during this difficult time, and there's probably going to be more difficult times coming. Okay, uh, again, more difficult times coming. Very difficult. 
but you need to be faithful to your church. If you want your church to grow, take someone with you this coming Lord's Day. Ask them to go to church with you. Most people will go if a friend invites them. Friendship evangelism is still the best method. And if you want your church to grow, just get people say, come here, my pastor preached this Sunday. Come and meet the people at our church. And uh, we're a loving congregation. Just get people to come. Invite them if you want your church to grow. And also be faithful to your church during these difficult times financially. The tithe is still God's, even though things are tough. We pray about special offerings, not about the tithe. Okay, special offerings are what we give in addition to the tithe. And be faithful to your church. Be faithful in the church services. Don't let weather keep you out of church. Don't let weather keep you out of church, okay? And what are you teaching your children if you say it's raining so we're not going to church today? The Bible says train a child up in the way he should old. That doesn't mean to tell them. It means to take them by the hand and show them. If you don't have a church home, you're in the Kansas City area. We invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. A lot of great churches in Kansas City. And we invite you to... It, Again, if you don't have a church home, uh, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We have service at 9 and 11 on Sunday. We have a place for every member of your family. Okay, we have children's services, youth service. We have nurseries and everything open, 9 and 11 on Sunday. And then at 6, and then on Wednesday nights, we have family night from 7 to 8.30. We have children's services. We have, uh, we have our nurseries open. We have a young married couples fellowship or a married couples fellowship. We have a young adult fellowship, 18 to 35. We have the youth in the youth chapter gym. And I teach in the chapel, not the big auditorium, in the chapel on Wednesday nights. Although this year, this week, because of water damage, I will be in the big auditorium. And I teach on Wednesday nights. We're currently, in, currently going through First and Second Thessalonians. And, we, and, and again, it's family night, a place for every member of your family from 7 to 8.30 on Wednesday nights. And you can look Sheffield up. It's SFLC for Sheffield Family Life Center.net. SFLC.net. And we're we're right down in the city. We have people come, come from every direction. Again, many great churches in Kansas City and be faithful to your church. Uh, what can you tell me about previous civilizations finding giant people with computers? Uh, a, a lot of it's fiction. I, I've said for many, many years, the world system is going to try to explain the rapture of the church by aliens. Aliens coming and taking people away. I believe every child under the age of accountability will be caught up at the rapture. Every child. Jesus said, suffer little children to come unto me. And stop forbidding them for of such is the kingdom of God. Until they get old enough to make a moral decision, then all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And I think they're going to be blaming aliens for it. There's a lot of false stuff being published right now today. And they claim the closest planet that could house ha, that could possibly have life is four light years away. Now light travels 186,000 miles a second. So that would be over 21 trillion miles away four light years and that's traveling at the speed of light okay for 21 trillion miles okay a trillion is a thousand billion a billion is a thousand million a million is a thousand thousand <laughs> okay Uh, I'll have to use these for next week, and I still got these here. And uh, next week, I'm uh, okay. I'm going to tackle those who've been sent in again. Yeah, I got quite a few of them this week, but 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 just let me show you the stack I've got here, okay? And uh, that's where I am. So, are we having trouble with this going on? Yeah. Okay, it says your live stream is. No, we only had a delay for about eight seconds. Eight seconds delay. Okay. Okay. All right. We thank you for watching the program. And again, you can send your questions to drgwwjr at gmail.com. drgwwjr at gmail.com. And God bless you. Thank you for watching. Have a great week in Jesus Christ.